Let's discuss Satan's weaknesses. It is written in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When the woman had conceived, he said, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, meaning Satan. And I'll turn there real quickly to get a correct quote, because we're going to be drawing from this even in the next lecture. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise. I want you to make a mental note of the word bruise. It shall bruise thy head. In other words, the woman's seed will bruise the serpent's head, that is to say, Christ. And thou shalt bruise his heel. And of course, this is when Christ was nailed to that cross. Uh, so the conflict began in that garden. And Satan, always that, what, what does Satan mean? It means adversary. That's what the word means when translated rather than transliterated. Adversary. And indeed, he is the adversary. He's your adversary. And that's why you must be wiser with the teachings of Christ than the serpent. But what is his weakness? It certainly isn't knowing Scripture, for he can quote Scripture. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to read a Scripture, but he has a little habit. His habit is that he twists Scripture. And unfortunately, most Christians are not sharp enough in God's Word to know when he does twist something. You can take an absolute fact and twist it just a little bit. It throws the, the whole thing off course. And you're as good as lost. By that I mean as far as sticking to basics and facts. The way. But note, to set the stage, Christ um, has fasted 40 days and nights here in the wilderness. Even as our people, we were discussing yesterday, wandered in the wilderness 40 years because they were afraid of those giants over the hill. And as we discovered in the scripture, there weren't any. There were no giants over there. They'd been gone for years. It was just rumor. And they were frightened. But Satan, uh, Christ simulating that 40 years by this 40 days, he could make it. They couldn't. All right. They ultimately made it out. But, I mean, he succeeded. He overcame. He had the victory over Satan. So Satan tempts him here in verse 6. And I want you to concentrate on it very carefully. And he said unto them, this is Satan speaking to Christ, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. You know, there's old Satan quoting Scripture. So Scripture is not necessarily his weakness, but then on the other hand, it is. God's Word is his downfall. It is his weakness. That's why it is your strength. That is why Jesus said, be wiser than the serpent. And that's why when you understand the word of God, then you can take those pitfalls out of your life. Call it the negative part of your life, if you like. Doesn't matter, for Satan is negative. Put those thoughts out of your mind. Don't waste your time on neg negative thoughts or anything that is negative. It is far better to think positive. It is written, he states, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Oh, that's right on line. That is very scriptural. He's quoting the 91st Psalm. Here's where he goes wrong. Least or lest at any time. He told a lie there. That's not what it says. That's not what the scripture says at all, nor does it imply that. Satan lied. How many Christians would be sharp enough to know that, though, to understand? That's why, I mean, it, isn't, it is not possible for every Christian to understand every scripture. But it is when Satan speaks them. He speaks them for a re quotes them, rather, for a reason. And you want to be at least sharp to that extent. Um, Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. That was incorrect. I want you to turn with me, if you would, at this time to the 91st Psalm. We're going to understand why it is correct, incorrect, rather. I'm just going to begin reading with verse 1 of that 91st Psalm, and we'll work down to the verse that he quoted so that you understand why Satan was frightened even of that scripture. That's why he sparred with it, for a very simple reason. 
these very scriptures tell of his downfall. For as it was promised from the very beginning in the garden, he's going to bruise your head. Therefore, number one, Satan's head is his weakness. Therefore, spiritually, what are we saying? You do not combat, necessarily, as a unit, the tail, all right? That is to say, uh, the, the uh, political, I mean, you you be keep aware of them, but you go for the head, and that always is the spiritual leader. You be aware of that head. Okay, and 90, Psalms 91 reads, He that dwelleth in, in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Do you want a secret place that um, you have comfort, silence? that God can lead you, that he can talk to you, it's under the wing of God. Those of you that are familiar with uh, the song of Moses, which the overcomers sing in Revelation 15, you'll note that God quotes in that song of Moses, I'll put you under my wing. And those of you that are lame, I'll put you up on my wing and I'll carry you. He loves us. He truly does. That's where your protection is, is in him, with him. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, for in him will I trust. Beloved, put your trust in none other. Oh, love your families with all your heart, but you must love our Father. He is your true Father. He is your closest relative. Now, don't anyone read into what I said there and say, well, boy, I can tell my mate to go hang it now. He said, no, I didn't say that. Spiritually, he is the creator of your soul, and his very law states that you'll get along with your mate and your family, okay? Three, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's the tempest or the tribulation, if you want to write it in there. In the column, that's what it means. Satan's tribulation, because we're going to be getting to this old Satan, this old dragon in just a minute. He will deliver you from it. As we discussed in the last um, lecture, there's no giants out there, because he protects us. Verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be the shield and buckler. You remember in the last lecture we did live in Matthew 23, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would take, have taken you under my wing, and you would not. He wants to. He's willing. But people are not. Five, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. In the Hebrew, this is really, there's no hunter's trap that's going to trap you in the night or in the darkness. Of course, Satan is that night and darkness nor for the arrow that flieth by day. That wing of God protects you. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. In other words, beloved, when you accept Christ, you become a child of light, and there is no night for you. You're a child of the day. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. What is Satan's main weapon in the end times? It's deception. If you have the truth in your mind, there can be a thousand on this hand be deceived by it, and a thousand on this hand be deceived by the one world system and the humanist, as that being a tentacle, if you would, of that head forementioned. You will not be deceived by it, for it shall come to pass exactly as it's written. It always has, it always shall. That's why you must grow familiar with the word of your father. He left this letter for you. Read it. Understand it. And you've heard me say many times, if you wrote one of your children a letter and they set it on a shelf and never read it, how would you feel? It's a very personal thing. It's real. Tell him you love him occasionally. Take his letter and read it, for it's written to you. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That is, if you have eyes to see. If you have eyes to see, you will see that reward. For it really comes today. There is no reward in the mental attitude 
and the nervous system of someone that is wicked through usury or other means and, and captivates or takes away the rights of innocent people. They're a nervous wreck. In other words, they pay part of their price today. They don't sleep good at night. If nothing else, greed causes them, it's a disease. More, 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 more. Now, again, this has nothing to do with the blessings of God's richness. If God's blessing you because you're living right, it has nothing to do with that. There's nothing wrong with being rich, and don't ever let anyone sell you that bill of goods. It's rich for the wrong reasons. Uh, that is a, that I will show you a very unhappy person. Eyes to see, then, in verse 8. 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitations. In other words, this is you, because you have made the Lord your uh, refuge, because you have made him your habitation, your tabernacle. 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's why if you're in the real truth, there's prayers are answered. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You recognize that scripture? We read it before in the New Testament. But what did Satan say it said? He said at any time. But the scripture says, in all thy ways. What is the way? The way is God's path, God's way, God's law, God's manner of doing things. Not any time. Any time is like a, a spur of the moment, quick thought. Jump off the building. That's stupid. It's, is that God's way to run? Is that the way Christians are supposed to impress people is to go to a high building and jump off? At any time? No, the angels are not going to keep that you in that. You jump off of a ten-story building and you're going to bounce just a little bit, not much. And that's it, all right? Because it's dumb. That's not in God's way. But Satan would sure like to have seen him try that, you see. So Satan has a way of twisting just a little bit, but not enough that most people know. Now, that one's easy to spot. There are other things in your daily life that he still attempts. And if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you know, you know one of the greatest weapons that Satan likes to use on someone? He likes to camouflage it with love, or what would appear to be love. Look at Peter. When Jesus told him, I'm going up to, uh, going up to Jerusalem, and they're going to crucify me. Peter, because of his love for Christ, he said, no, Lord, we're going to get an army together. We're going to prevent this. The Lord said, you get behind me, Satan. You see, that was Satan using Peter's love for the Lord to try to interfere with the way of God. The way of God was that crucifixion for you. For you. To pay that price. He was paying off all your sins, friend. He loves you that much. Paying for your shortcomings. Your sins. So we see Satan in his way. We see a weakness. You can, you can um, predetermine many times the way he shall operate. Okay, let's continue with the quote then. Verse 12. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Well, you see, he had already taken away the logic of the Scripture. This is as it should be. As long as you do it God's way, you're going to be blessed. The angels will protect you. The saints will protect you. The, angel, the saints being departed uh, people, which are now angels, understand. Your angel always has the face of God, quoted from Matthew. It's a fact. Thou shalt tread upon the lion. Now, this is the part that Satan's afraid of. You sharpen up for me. This is why this was on his mind. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. You know what an adder is? That's a snake. The young lion and the dragon. The dragon is the name used for Antichrist, the role Satan plays in the book of Revelation, meaning the unveiling, 
We're talking about Antichrist. The dragon shalt thou trample under foot. In other words, you're going to bruise his head. All right, you're going to bruise his head. 14, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, and the Almighty Father has when he rose from that cross, because he hath known my name. He was not tricked. That even goes to his many-membered body today by deception. He shall come upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Which this really is just a long way of saying I'm going to issue eternal life because of him, because of that price. 92, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. That's what we're going to do this morning in taking Holy Communion. That is praising him, showing glory to him. An act of obedience and love, saying, I believe. Because you don't believe just a little bit. You either believe or you don't. There's no part ways. If you believe a thing, it's a fact. And if not, you just don't believe, though you may claim you do. You don't. It is a reality. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psalm strut, upon the harp, and a solemn, with a solemn sound. That means meditation. Meditation. There's a ten-stringed instrument you're going to be playing on in a spiritual sense before very long, and they're ten crowns, and they're going to make a they're not going to come out a very smooth, uh, it's not going to come out in harmony. All right? I speak of Revelation chapter 13, 1 and 2. 4. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work, I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Beloved, you've got the victory if you just reach out and claim it. If you will keep the negative things out of your family and life, you will have no problems that you can't just handle. You're going to have problems. As, in, as an example, a good marriage is not a marriage that never fights a little bit. I mean, argues. A good marriage is a marriage that can put together a marriage after an argument because there are very few marriages that never have an argument. And if you can't put it together, you really don't have a good, strong marriage. There's only one way you can put it together, and that's to be positive in his word. Because you see, as we learned in that first lecture, those four winds, which win Ruach in the Hebrew tongue, the spirits, can even change the minds of people with your prayers. It can instill love where there's misunderstanding. Troubled waters, it can smooth them. For the angels we spoke of, and I don't want you to create a new angel religion. It's just a fact that they do. They'll help you. Four your benefit when you follow God's way, not Satan's way, God's way, way meaning path. <clears throat> okay, um, what verse we got to five? O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Truly they are, but they're simple in the simplicity in which Christ taught. So very simple that sometimes the worldly wise don't understand. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up as spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, are most high forevermore, eternal. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. Two times for emphasis. There's no giants, beloved. They perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. What is this anointing? It is, and what is the oil? The anointing is taking the oil of our people, the olive oil, and in faith and obedience using it, anointing. The oil does not accomplish the miracle. 
The oil simply shows your obedience to him and his love pours forth. Spills over you. You can actually feel his wing. Understand I speak in a spiritual sense. Encompass you as he takes you into his heart because you understand his letter and love him for having written it. Mine eyes shall also shall see my desire on mine enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. I'm going to hear them fall, is what it says in Hebrew. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon, that always being symbolic of what Satan wanted to do, if you understand the idioms of the Hebrew, that he was a plain old Tiasha, which in the Hebrew tongue means box cedar, didn't amount to much. Those that he planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Personal care. You'll read of it in Ezekiel chapter 44. The Zadok, God's elect. 14. They shall, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. In other words, um, this has to do with the, uh, I suppose we could call it a metaphor that Christ used when he was carrying the cross up the hill to, go, uh, to Golgotha. He said, if they do this to the green tree, meaning while the blood was circulating in his veins, what will they do to the dry? It means you will have life abundant, a life that we can only get a glimpse of at this time, eternal life, life evermore, 15, to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him you got that beloved there is in us but there is not in him that's why that you must go to him not man necessarily oh it's good to have fellowship don't misunderstand me and love your brothers but he in him there is no unrighteousness he loves you he is sincere about your betterment He'll take care of it. He'll handle it. He wants to handle it. It is his will that all be saved. But will means it is his wish that all be saved. They've still got to love him or they won't be. They've still got to love him. Now, why did Satan come here? Why was he afraid of this? He knew the word of God when it said, bruise the head or tromp with the feet the dragon he knew very well what the scripture was saying what God was saying therefore there comes a warning in the 94th Psalm to you God inserted it to you 94 17 I believe that's right yes in closing 94 17 Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. In other words, I'd have been in a, in, a, in a silent old grave. That's all it would have been to it. Grave most often is translated hell. It means dust to dust, and that would have been it. No more. Fini. Ashes in Hebrew is, a, is also an idiom that means forever and ever. In other words, when you burn something and it is consumed, the elements return back to what they originally were, basically, forever, which means you don't exist. Just a touch, if you ever wonder what a burning hell is, that's what it is. It turns the soul to ashes, and it's for never and ever. Okay. Now, 18. When I said, My foot slippeth, then, thy mercy, O Lord, help me up. He'll do it. See, this is the promise. Satan tried to destroy this by saying at any time. And in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Just meditate on him. I don't mean 24 hours a day, and sometimes people, one person, it takes more meditating than it does others. Just be comfortable. Find your speed. Find what it takes to comfort you, and do accordingly. And those around you, always be thoughtful. A Christian is strong enough that a Christian can be thoughtful of his fellow man. You can afford to be generous in giving of time, etc., to the rest of your families if you happen to have a non-Christian. You can be generous because you can set an example if you really, truly do it his way. He'll comfort you even in that. 
Shall the throne of an iniquity have fellowship with thee? Aha! What is the throne of iniquity? Have you ever read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it states that the son of perdition shall come and sit in Jerusalem on a throne and claim to be God? That's the dragon, friend. That's Antichrist. He shall. It will come to pass. And you can have no fellowship with it. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? which frameth mischief by a law. In other words, they take the law of the land, one worldism, and frameth, frameth mischief against the Godhead itself, such as using an atheistic nation as a superpower in the end times to bring great pressure upon a world system that will ultimately make his throne a reality because of that law. 21, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. They even condemn Christ, for he was the only innocent blood. We may feel sometimes that ours is. I'm sorry, it isn't. Only in him, only in him, he is the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. You remember in that Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses I mentioned earlier, God makes it very clear. He said, God, their rock, meaning the Kenites, the sons of Satan and those that would follow this throne, their rock is not our rock. And in the Hebrew, a small r, if I may use that terminology. But our rock, with a capital R, is God. Tyre. In the Hebrew tongue means rock. Ezekiel 28 tells of his kingdom. Satan's kingdom, that is. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. That is the time of the eternity. The negative part of God's plan will be fulfilled. It shall run its course. And Satan will accomplish that that he must but they will be cut off. How many are condemned to death at this time? Only one, plus some of his renegade angels, and that is to say Satan. And many people would say, well, I know an old boy died and he is so mean, I know he went to hell. He just ain't around. Not so, friend. He's in paradise awaiting judgment. You've got to have judgment before a sentence can be passed, all right? And until that judgment, there's hope. There's hope. So I thank God for that rock and the fact that he is your protection. You can go into him. You can be in a business meeting and have a crisis arrive that most people's mind, their eyeballs would click and they would show white and perspiration would come upon them. And they would try to look like, I'm cool, man. I'll handle this. But when you've got him, you can just reach up. Just press a seal there in your forehead just a little bit and go into him. And those words will start coming forth. And he will lead you through that like a king or a queen when you believe. You see, it's not a religion. God's not a religion. He's real. It's a reality. So put your faith in him. Not man, not in a religion, not in a society, but in your father. For he is the one that you can always depend on. I don't care if it's business or what. You can be the coolest cat in the, in the congregation or out of business. And also the most successful. And people will even say, where does he or she get their strength from? And it's so simple. He's our rock. That is why he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. That is to say, understand my word. And I will add all these things unto you. It's so simple and it's so real. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, for being that wing, Father. That wing that 
hovers over us in times of trouble. And Father, we know of a surety that in Thee we have that peace and that contentment and the only true happiness and joy in this world. We just thank you for it. In Yeshua, the Messiah's name. Amen. Hey, the bruisers. I apologize before even teaching this that I really wanted more time to prepare it. But the Father only gave it about a day and a half ago. So you're going to get it in kind of a rough form. I think he's got a reason for that. I think he wants you to do part of the research as well. This takes us on and beyond in the 11th chapter of Daniel where we, came, where we came to the place that the Shah's son would make an appearance. At least we say watch that, it would appear. We said that two and a half years ago, and believe it or not, as you'll probably notice on the bulletin board, the Shah's son did slip back into Iran. He took a television transmitter with him and told his people to be ready. He was returning. So the Father's word, in as much as in Daniel 11, if you'll turn there, those of you that have not studied the tape, what happens next are the last revision or updating on Daniel. It, you will find it in the 11th chapter. And I apologize if you haven't. I'll just real briefly touch. You'll remember the four winds that we spoke of in the first lecture of this uh, meeting, fellowship. In chapter 11, you'll note in verse 4, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be, shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, stating that that same divine agency will have a, a purpose and will be part of the driving force within that. Then we had the king of the south and the king of the north uh, that were involved, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic kingdom, which are known as the north and the south. The north, let's put it in common English so that we understand what we're talking about, is the modern-day Persia, which is, uh, I should say, modern-day Iran. Daniel was taken to the river to Hick the river uh, Hittical, which is today's Tigris, right on the 750-mile front, now between Iran and Iraq. It continues on, and it tells in verse 6 of the king of the north and the south that we're pretty good friends, and you will all remember Sadat, and you'll all remember the Shah of Iran. They were good friends. As a matter of fact, the Shah of Iran went to Egypt and died there with the protection of Sadat. Sadat also took the sons of that king of the north to Egypt with him. Many of them have traveled back, not many of them, there's not that many, but made many trips back and forth even to this nation. And you will find that the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, that would have been Sadat at that time in the ninth verse of this eleventh chapter, and shall return to his own land, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of forces. I wonder how many of you remember that day that the army of Sadat, those forces, which he called his sons, passed before him, and then he was gunned down like an animal by his own. It came to pass. And then Khomeini, of course, uh, comes into the picture back in the fifth verse. We're not going to cover all of this. It's, it's, I'm not going to say it's old hat for everyone, but you'll have an opportunity through those tapes to understand that. According to this prophecy, if we take verse 18 in this 11th chapter then, and this, and this, this being Khomeini, the king of the north, it would appear that he almost conquers Iraq. I feel that is on the horizon within, say, six months. Not necessarily totally conquer, but he shall move further into the territory of Iraq. And this shall he turn his face into the isles, and shall take many, but a prince of his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. I feel this is the Shah of Iran who is, is at this moment, making every drive he can to unseat Khomeini. You don't hear much of it. You hear quite a bit of it on the Reuters wire service and in some of the national presses you can find somewhat again without repetition an article on the board. Now, and we even have film clips of the Shah's son. 
as uh, he pleaded with his people to make ready. You know that in contest in Kuwaiti, I believe it was, that four Iranian weightlifters defected. And it is believed that they defected to Iraq or um, to help join the fight against Khomeini. You're hearing of this more and more. So Khomeini certainly is going to get news from home when he makes that drive. Listen to verse 19. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. That will be the end of Khomeini. Now, as I stated, this is, specu this is supposition. It's teaching you how to watch. These events have come to pass exactly as the scripture has called them to happen. It is history also. Now, when we get to verse 21, it becomes future prophecy even to where we are now. And that's what we'll be covering today. But when the Shah's son comes into power, verse 20, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser in, uh, of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, that is, of the old Persian empire, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger, I want you to note that, neither in anger nor in battle. In other words, he's going to be removed peaceably by a greater figure, which, of course, would be Antichrist. He is spoken of in the next verse. Now, with that thought in mind, and I pray that that you're familiar with that. That, I, in other words, we did a, we have covered about two hours teaching there in about three minutes. So, I know most of you have been through it. But be that as it may, now what happens next? Twenty-one. And his estate shall stand up a vile person. This is even a creature, if you would, in the manuscripts, because he is not necessarily a flesh man, human man. He is a supernatural, the dragon. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably. This is why so many people will be deceived by Antichrist. They're expecting war, contention, bloodshed. Hey, it's just the opposite. He's coming as Savior. He's coming as the deliverer of this world. He's coming saying, I've come to rapture you people away. And to the Muslims, he'll be saying, I am your leader returned to, to uh, re- uh, sit on the throne of the rock and they'll allow it and obtain the kingdom by flatteries flattery saying what the statement just made i'm it i am super he will perform miracles in their sight they will not be mentally prepared to even give a second thought to not receiving him because the people of today are not prepared to see miracles performed Revelation 13 says he'll snap his fingers and lightning will come down from heaven. Hey, that's, that's quite a feat. People will go buggy over stars, you know, people, a flesh man. Wait until you see this one, the most beautiful of the archangels, standing saying he is deliverer. He is Christ. He is the anointed. The only trouble is it's just not with God's oil. It's his own oil. Okay. And, uh, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflowing from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. This is to say those that do follow the true God will not have an opportunity to even talk to the people hardly because they're not going to listen. They will not listen when they have a supernatural entity to listen to. That's why it is important that the prophecy be understood before the fact. The prophecy be declared before the fact because nobody will believe you after it happens. Do you understand? A prophecy is not a prophecy if it does not come forth before the fact. That's what gives a prophecy power. I'm speaking of God's prophecy. 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work a deceitful, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. This word, as you know, and you've heard me teach before, is goy in the Hebrew tongue, and it, it is those Kenites, his own sons, his own children. It is obvious even today, those that fight against Christ, those Christ taught about in Revelation 2, 9, those who claim to be of Judah and are not, and in fact do lie and are the sons of Satan, or the synagogue of Satan. Not my words, God's word, okay? He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, that's the richest, 
And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, the riches, yea. And he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. What is his devices? Deception. Lies, the very lie that he is God. As it is written in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he's the son of perdition, of Pallia, Satan, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. Where is the holy place? Don't be fooled, it's the rock. The rock from which Christ rose, the rock of which Abraham offered Isaac up as, as a, a sacrifice. The rock uh, that the Islamic faith believes that Muhammad ascended the holy place. That's where he intends to sit. Does it need a new building? No. The rock. He's going to claim to be the rock. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a great army and a mighty army, but he shall not stand for they. Underline the word they, it's the small people, the Kenites. They shall deception and lies almost instantly, as long as it takes the signal to go up and come back down. For you are watching live pictures now of the very building they're meeting in in Iceland. So you see, people sometimes forget that miracles are happening. We wouldn't have considered them miracles 50 years ago, but no longer. Let's, let's continue on and see what happens. 27, and both these kings, that is to say, the king of the south and the king of the north, that uh, Gorbachev being representing Esau, even to the point that God has placed, uh, Esau is Edom, which means red. And God has placed a birthmark on Gorbachev's head that the whole world can see and being a scholar of God's word should recognize that it's a sign from God this is the one. At least you'd better watch it. Okay, both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper for yet. The end shall be at the time appointed. In other words, God's in control. It's not going to happen until he's ready for it to. You might say, well, President Reagan wouldn't speak lies. 